Hello and welcome back to the channel. You join myself, Dr. James Gill, for another clinical skills video. Today we're going to do the deep dive on the cardiovascular examination. So we're going to go through each step, what we're looking for and why we're doing those particular tests. So to start off with our cardiovascular system, obviously we need to uh, gain consent. Hello, my name's Dr. Gill. I've been asked to do a cardiovascular uh, examination of yourself. Before we go any further, could we please confirm your name and date of birth? Thomas Alvey, 2nd January 2000. Thank you. So this is going to involve you lying back, letting us have a look at your hands, getting you to take off your shirt, then we're going to have a look at your neck. I'm also going to place my hands on your chest, listen there with the stethoscope, and also look at your feet. Is that okay? Yep. Super. So if I can get you to lie back to start off with. And before we start, do you have any problems that you're aware of with your heart? No. Super. So at the start, it's important to give it, get an idea how the patient is feeling at that moment in time before you go on with your examination. So as we've got the patient lying on the bed, we want to have a look at them to see if we can see any obvious distress. Are they looking uncomfortable? Do they appear short of breath? Your respiratory rate is a really good um, tell for how the patient is physiologically. So if you've got a problem with your heart, if there's a problem with your blood pressure, if you've got a big infection, you're unlikely to be able to sit there with a normal respiratory rate, even if everything else seems to be all right. We also want to have a look around the patient to see if we can see any paraphernalia, aspirin bottles, um, oxygen cylinders, anything that might indicate what's going on with the patient. Having assessed the patient appears to be calm and at rest, we want to have a look over the hands. So if you put your hands up for me, please. So in terms of looking over the fingers, what are we looking for? So we're looking to see if there's any spooning of the fingernails, i.e. we've got indents suggesting we've got iron deficiency anemia. We're looking to see if we can see any tar staining that might indi indicate someone is smoking. And we want to press over the fingertips to see what the capillary refill is like. Other things that we might see on nails themselves uh, would be uh, splinter hemorrhages, now these little black dots are indicative of endocarditis, but don't um, worry too much about them because most people will actually have them because the commonest cause is not endocarditis, but it's actually microtraumas. So just digging in the garden, hitting your hand, for example, or if you're like me and bite your nails. I think I've got a few at the moment. So if you can put your fingers together like so for me, and we're putting the fingernails together, we can see Shamroth's window, and we know there's no signs of clubbing. From a cardiovascular perspective, clubbing would be indicative of bacterial endocarditis and any of the uh, cyanotic heart conditions, such as tetralogy of Flot, for example. If you could turn your hands over for me. Staying with that concept of uh, septic emboli, we're going to look for Janeway lesions, which are painless lesions on the thena and hyperthena eminence, or have we got any Osler's nodes, which are painful swellings. These are septic emboli, have again lodged in the tissues and the bacteria there, rather than killing off the, um, uh, the, the, um, the tissue around it, as we see with splinter hemorrhages, we've actually got prolifer proliferation of the bacteria resulting in swelling and pain and infection there. Now here we can see a couple of spots on his fingers. Um, how long have these been there for? Uh, forever. So we're not going to worry too much about those uh, in terms of whether or not they could be Janeway lesions. They don't certainly fit that. The other thing we're looking for on the hand is the, um, the, the palmar creases. Uh, we can see we've got normal um, coloration to the palmar creases. If there was a pallor there, so the palmar creases look pale, it might indicate the presence of an anemia. The other thing that we want to have a look for on uh, the, the, the palms and the hands is tendon xanthoma. So yellow deposits running along the tendons which are associated with hypercholesterolemia. Having looked over the hands, we then want to check both um, pulses at the same time. Now, when we check the radial uh, pulse, we're checking for the rate and rhythm. So how fast is the pulse going and is it um, coming through regularly? So for example, one, two, one, two. Or is it irregular, so there's no pattern to the beat? If we find that, we want to get an ECG to clarify more information about the, um, what that rhythm is. Now I'm taking both hands at the same time because I'm feeling for a radial, radial delay. I want to feel both pulses coming through at the same time. 
We then need to move up the arm to check at the uh, antecubital fossa. Here we're checking for the brachial pulse. Now we want to check at this point because that's going to let us feel the character of the pulse. So is it a strong pulse? Is it a bounding pulse or a weak and thready pulse? So we may have a, a bounding pulse if we've got problems with the thyroid causing a, um, a hyperthyroidism or if the patient, for example, has heart failure or maybe has had a myocardial infarction in the past resulting in a weak pulse, we'd feel that here at the brachial pulse. Now we can't take that from the radial pulse because that's a smaller bore artery. We need to be going higher up. It is also possible to check for the character at the carotids, but in many patients I prefer to do that on the brachial because it's less um, uncomfortable for them. Similarly, there's a theoretical risk that if someone had um, plaques and issues with the carotid, you could potentially throw off a clot, but I think that's incredibly unlikely. Staying with the arm, we will need to have a look um, at the pulse in a different way, and we're going to check for a collapsing pulse. So, do you have any problems with your shoulder? So, I'm going to grip the patient's arm tightly, making sure that I can feel the uh, radial pulse. And I'm then going to lift the pulse up straight, and I want to see if the pulse is staying in the same place, or does it feel like it's moving down the arm. What we're looking for there is if we have an aortic regurgitation, we're increasing the column of blood against that um, faulty valve, and that faulty valve prolapses backwards, meaning the pulse falls backwards down the hand. Now there's something called a water hammer pulse. This is a kind of a Victorian toy. Um, and again, it feels like a pulse is changing in this small glass children's toy. That same sensation is what people describe um, the, the collapsing pulse as feeling like, but I've never really played with a water hammer, so I can't quite confirm what that is, uh, what that would feel like, but it's definitely something that, if you end up in a Victorian toy shop, to have a go with and see how it feels. Carrying on up the arm, so staying nice straight lines, we're going to have a look at the face. So if you could take your glasses off for me, and if you lean back, and I'm just going to lift your eyelids down and look up for me. And we're looking at the, um, the conjunctiva to see if there's any evidence of pallor, which might again go along with an, an anemia, suggesting maybe the heart is having to work harder. Now if you could look down for me. And we're looking at the sclera. I can't see any yellow, uh, yellowing there. Now there is some debate whether or not that should be included in a cardiovascular assessment. However, there's no such thing as never in medicine you could get a hemolytic anemia, whereby the blood is being broken down, which would cause raised levels of bilirubin, would potentially affect the cardiovascular system, and we'd see that as a potential jaundice in the eyes. We also need to have a look around the eyes themselves, so we want to see if there's any evidence of uh, uh, xanthelasma, so cholesterol deposits uh, around the eyelids or underneath the eye. This is incredibly important from a cardiovascular perspective, as if you can see that, it means that the patient has incredibly high levels of cholesterol, and probably it's going to be something in the family, maybe familial hypercholesterolemia, which is going to put them at significant risk of cardiovascular events, such as myocardial infarction. The other thing that we need to be looking at the eyes for is for corneal arcus. So we're looking around the eye to see if we can see a, a, a yellow or whitish coloured ring. Now that can be due to two things. Again, it might indicate a raised level of uh, cholesterol because those could be lipid deposits. However, we will also see those um, in uh, patients as they age, where it has a slightly different uh, name called senile arcus. Um, and actually, there are some movies where, with some aged movie stars, if you have a close look when they're getting their close-ups, you can see that. Uh, one of the people you notice on particularly is Sylvester Stallone. So, going from the eyes, we then need to have a look at uh, the mouth. I'm starting off with the lips. I'm saying, can I see any blue tinging to the lips? So, indicative potentially of peripheral cyanosis. But it also might correlate with central cyanosis, which we'd have to look at for in a moment. So if you could open your mouth for me, please. 
and stick your tongue out please. And looking at the tongue, I can't see any smoothness. There's no pallor to it. Uh, there's no loss of, uh, there's no changes in color. And also I can't see any problems to the corners of the mouth. If you put your tongue to the top of your mouth, and I'm having a look at the blood vessels under the mouth. Thank you, you can relax. Uh, those blood vessels aren't blue. So even if we had seen some blueness to the lips, which as I say, we might be able to uh, describe as peripheral cyanosis, if there was blueness under the tongue, then we'd say that that would be central cyanosis. And we know that there's a problem with the oxygenation of the blood. Whether or not that's a problem with the respiratory system, where the blood can't be oxygenated, or there's a problem with the heart, for example, tetralogy of Fallot, where you have mixing of the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, so we're not getting sufficient oxygenation from that perspective, we wouldn't be able to tell, but it would certainly mean some more for us to pay attention to shortly. So having looked at the eyes and uh, the mouth, we then need to go on to look at the neck. So we are going to have a look at the JVP, but before we do that, we need to check the lymph nodes of the head and neck. So I'm just going to stand behind you, if that's okay, and I'm going to put my hands on your neck from behind, and I'm going to see if I can find any lumps and bumps to your neck. Is that okay? Yeah. Super. So we stand behind the patient, and we're going to start off under the chin, checking the submental lymph nodes, moving along to the, uh, the angle of the jaw, the submandibular, to the angle of the jaw, checking the um, uh, tontular lymph nodes, we're going in front of the ears to do the preauricular and behind the ears to the posteriorular. If you could just lean forward for me. We're checking the back of the neck and back of the head to check for the occipital nose. And in that position, we can then move on to the neck itself, checking for um, uh, any um, uh, deep and superficial uh, cervical chain lymph nodes. And lean backwards for me and just making sure there's nothing there and covering over the base of the ribs. So there's no problems there. So we're going to carry on to have a look at your neck. We want to have a look to see if we can see the jugular venous pulsation. And in terms of doing that, if you could turn your head to look that way for me. I'm looking at uh, the uh, sternocleidomastoid heads. And I'm just moving the t-shirt down ever so slightly to look at the base of the neck. It's very important that you appropriately expose the patient when necessary. If you can have a look to the base of the neck adequately, then I would say it's reasonable to keep the patient's t-shirt on at this point. However, if that's not possible, then obviously asking them to disrobe will be entirely appropriate. But keep in mind at all times, what is the level of comfort for your patient and whether or not you would want to be exposed at that point as well. So having a look, I can see the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the JVP is normally located between the two um, heads here, just above the clavicle. Now, in a lot of patients, we're not going to be able to see um, that JVP straight away because it's a much more subtle pulse than the carotids. And I can see what appears to be the uh, carotid pulse slightly uh, medially compared to the JVP. So one way I can compare the two is simply by touch. The carotid pulse should be palpable, whereas the JVP should be impalpable. When I press on it, I can't feel it. We can also look at the waveform. The, um, the carotid pulse should beat in time, one, two, one, two with the pulse. However, the JVP has a, uh, two separate waveforms, so it would not necessarily match the pulse. There is, however, one final way that we can confirm that, and that's with the hepatojugular reflux. For this, we will ask the patient to take their T-shirt off. So if you could take your T-shirt off, please. And we'll just put that down here for you. So looking at uh, where we found the JVP, we, want, we draw an imaginary line from the maneuverable sternal angle, which is, in, uh, which is in line with the second rib, vertically upwards. And we come across to see where we can feel that pulsation. As long as that is intersecting with this imaginary ruler at less than four to five centimetres, we know there isn't a problem. However, if we're having difficulty seeing it, as I said, we might want to do an additional test, and that's the hepatojugular reflux. So we look at the patient's abdomen, we see if we can see any evidence of scars, any evidence that there may have been an operation to this area. I, can't, I can see one small scar here, but nothing to worry me here. Do you have any pain to the upper abdomen? Brilliant. So what we're going to do, we get you to turn your head that way, and I'm going to push down into your stomach, and I'm going to watch uh, your neck as we do so. So one, two, three, 
in and up and relax. And it's a quite short, short, sharp movement. And in doing that, that push, puts pressure on the liver, results in increased back, back flow up through the vessels. So we're getting that blood going up the uh, JVP and we see that rise as well. So here it wasn't very easy to see the JVP, but by doing the hepatojugular reflux, we saw it rise up from where it was hiding just at the edge of the clavicle, and we know that everything is normal. However, if we did have a patient that had something causing increased pressure at the atrium, for example, um, they had pericarditis or hyperinflated lungs with COPD, or if they'd had a, an atrial myxoma, anything that's affecting uh, the uh, atrium there could result in the JVP having risen so high up, we can't see it with the patient sat here. We might, if it's gone up inside the skull, see their earlobe waggling at the back. The other thing we could do to check in that situation is if you could sit forwards for me, and we're just going to lie you flat. So here we can see the JVP just pulsing away nicely at the base of the neck. And one of the other things that you can tell to confirm the JVP is that it will indraw when the patient has their first inspiration. So if you take a deep breath in for me. And relax. So we can see that JVP disappearing in as we breathe in. So here we can see the JVP pulsing away nicely at the base of the neck. And if we get the patient to take a deep breath in, we'll see the JVP in draw as we do so with the change in pressure around the chest. So take a deep breath in, please. And then relax. So that in drawing of breath has changed the pressure in the chest, particularly around the right atrium. So we've resulted in a reduction in pressure around the atrium, causing the JVP to be pulled back. Just to reiterate that once more, take another deep breath for me and then breathe normally. So, and after having seen that JVP, we're just going to sit you back up again. Okay. Having looked at the neck then, we need to come back down thinking about pressures to check our blood pressure. So we're going to take our manual sphig and we want to check that it's the right size for the patient. So we're going to do that by checking the size of the cuff against the patient's arm, and we want to make sure the cuff is approximately 40, which we're just on the right side of here. It's very important that our cuff is not too small because that will cause a falsely elevated blood pressure. So for example, if you have a patient with a large BMI, if you're using pulse, a blood pressure cuff which is too small, you'll falsely read their blood pressure. So it's vitally important for accurate medicine to make sure we're using the correct, uh, the correct kit. So we're going to put the, uh, the uh, uh, we're going to put the sigma monitor um, uh, gauge on and I'm going to do this manually first. So I'm going to hold on to the uh, pulse and I'm going to increase the pressure. Okay. And the pulse has disappeared at about 100, beats, uh, 100 uh, millimeters mercury. Now the reason why we need to do it twice, first uh, manually and then with the uh, stethoscope, is because it's possible in uh, some patients, normally the elderly, about 20% of patients will have what's called a, a systolic uh, uh, blood pressure lag. So what I mean by that is, when we listen to uh, the, uh, the pulse sounds, the Korotov noises with the stethoscope, we may actually get um, the first um, Korotov noise being only there for a brief moment and then disappearing. And it's possible that you may miss that first sound before it then reappears, which can mean we're going to give a falsely low blood pressure. However, we would be able to feel it throughout. So we know roughly where we should be finding that systolic in our patient here, around about 100. So we should be able to expect to hear that first sound then and then disappear when we're going to find the diastolic. So we're moving over to the uh, diaphragm, putting that in over the brachial artery, tying up the valve and increasing the pressure. So I'm going to go 20 millimeters higher 
faster than we were originally. Okay, and then slowly letting it out. And we've got a good first sound at 100. And then it comes back at 60. And then it disappears at 60. So we're quite happy with that uh, blood pressure. And we take things off again. Okay. Having done our uh, uh, basic uh, start to the cardiovascular assessment, we then need to focus onto the chest. So the first thing we want to do is find the apex beat. So the apex beat is the uh, most lateral position of the heart with inside the chest, where essentially the, the, the apex of the heart will touch against the chest wall. And in young or thin patients, you may be actually be able to see this location. So possibly I can see a small movement of the skin um, over here, but we need to confirm we're looking in the right place. And the way that we do that is we find the maneuverable sternal angle. So uh, this is the interface between the sternum and the manubrium, and that lines up with the second rib. So we then want to count down to the fifth intercostal space. So from the second rib, there's the second rib space, third rib space, fourth rib space, fifth rib space, and we're going to move along and round, so we're in the mid-cavicular line. And then we're going to place the flat of our hand over that. And I can feel the apex beat exactly where I thought I could see it and where I can feel it with my fingers. Now we may have a patient who perhaps has a smaller heart, maybe they've got an increased body habitus and we can't feel it here, in which case we get the patient to roll over onto their left side and come back for me. In doing so that causes the heart to move over in the chest, hopefully coming closer to the wall so we can feel that impulse there. Now the reason why that's important is we may find that the, um, the apex beat has shifted from that fifth intercostal space mid-cavicular line. That can happen, for example, in left ventricular hypertrophy. There are other conditions, so for example with cardiomyopathies, where we may get a baggy heart um, and that may change the apex beat to a much more diffuse character, so it's less easily to determine exactly where it is as opposed to the nice tap against the um, chest wall there. Carrying on with our palpation, because our standard approach would be inspection, palpation, percussion and auscultation, we want to place our hands flat on the patient's chest wall. So I'm going to put the um, flat of my hand across the left side of uh, the chest and I'm trying to feel if my heart hand is pushed off the chest wall, which would be indicative of a cardiac heave again associated with left ventricular hypertrophy, the large size of the heart literally moving the chest wall forwards. We want to do a similar and you can place your hands either side of the sternum um, and there I'm feeling for a thrill which is a palpable murmur. So when we do find a murmur using our stethoscope we need to be able to grade it zero being it's only detectable by the most esteemed physicians and professors all the way up to grade six. Not only is it audible outside the patient's chest, but it can be felt as well. Um, and an example of that might be the click of a metallic valve, or potentially an incredibly serious aortic stenosis with that coarse jet of uh, blood. So, having not found any abnormalities on our inspection of the chest wall, um, we then need to get our stethoscope and here we're going to keep in mind that there are two modes on the electronic stethoscope, but there are two ways of using a regular stethoscope, whether or not that's the diaphragm or the bell. We're going to start off with the diaphragm first, listening over the four regions of the heart. The reason why we start with the diaphragm is it's going to attenuate most sounds. So whilst we're uh, doing that, I'm going to hold the pulse at the same time and I'm listening over the aortic region, which is over uh, the second intercostal space um, uh, to the right sternal edge, then over the pulmonary region, which is second intercostal space, left pulmonary edge. 
coming down to the tricuspid region, which is uh, the lower left sternal border. And then finally, going around to listen over uh, the apex, which is the fifth intercostal space mid-cavicular line. And we're going to change over then to using the bell, which again we're going to listen over the apex to see if we can hear any changes, and as well over the left um, lower sternal border. So the reason why we need to change um, what, we're, what we're using in terms of using the, uh, the bell, because that allows us to pick up much lower frequency sounds. With the diaphragm, the large size of it means that all sounds are collected and amplified by the, the very thin membrane of the diaphragm. But that will mean that um, low frequency sounds are lost in that somewhat. By comparison, when we move over to the bell, the low frequency sounds are collected by the concave nature of the bell, so are amplified over the higher frequency sounds. So it allows us to be able to hear something such as mitral stenosis more easily. So when we're listening for the heart sounds, we need to listen for S1, the first heart sound, and S2, the second heart sound. Now, the first heart sound is caused by the mitral and tricuspid valve closing and the aortic and pulmonary valve opening. Conversely, the second is the inverse, the mitral and tricuspid opening and the aortic and pulmonary closing. The easiest way of learning this is not to memorize it, but to think what's going on in the heart. So S1, the start of the cardiac cycle, is the ventricles squeezing together in order to do that, we've got to close the mitral and tricuspid valve, otherwise blood's going to go the wrong way, and we want to open the pulmonary and aortic valves to send blood to the lungs and the body. Conversely, when we're looking at S2, in diastole, the heart is relaxed. Thus, we close the pulmonary and aortic valves and the mitral and tricuspid open. So if you think about what's going on with a cardiac cycle, you should know what your S1 and S2 sounds are. Similarly, with that, we can tell what we're going to hear from a diastolic and a systolic in terms of our murmurs. So our systolic murmurs are going to be aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation, ASMR, because the, in S1, the, the heart is contracting, so forcing blood out through the open aortic, uh, a valve. If there's narrowing, we're going to hear that aortic stenosis, brewing, so shooting that blood out. Conversely, at that point, the mitral valve should be closing to stop blood going um, out to the body, in which case we'd expect nothing to be there, but if there was, it would be the mitral valve regurgitating, so again, we have a systolic murmur there. Conversely, with our S2, where we're in diastole, the heart is relaxing. Now we're talking about aortic regurgitation and mitral stenosis, so arms. Here uh, we've got uh, the aortic valve falling back on itself, allowing blood to flow the wrong way. And we've got mitral stenosis, so a narrowing of that um, uh, heart valve, causing again a brewy or jet as that blood is forced through that narrowed opening. The other moment that we need to listen for, again going to the diaphragm, um, is the mitral uh, regurgitation. So here we're looking in the mid-axillary line, again holding the pulse, and we're just going to listen directly over here to see if we can hear a systolic murmur. There are, however, a couple of special manoeuvres that we need to do. So, putting the stethoscope back in, checking onto the pulse, onto the bell of the diaphragm, and if you could roll over to your left side for me. And we're listening again over the apex beat to see if we can hear the murmur of mitral stenosis. Okay, and if you could sit up for me. Now we're then going to listen for the murmur of aortic regurgitation. So again, I'm going to take the pulse and I'm going to listen to the lower left sternal border. Note that is not what we've previously described as the aortic region. We're going to take a deep breath in and breathe in together, deep breath out and hold it and breathe normally. 
So whilst you're in that position, ideally you want to hear one or two beats going through so you can get your ear in position. By having the patient breathing out as they're doing so, we're changing the pressures in the chest, worsening the regurgitation on the, uh, uh, the aortic valve, increasing the sound volume, partially because we've also got less lung in the way. The reason why we're listening in a different position is the um, auscultation sites do not align with the heart valves, they align with the movement of uh, um, blood. So it's the direction in which the sound will be travelling. And for aortic regurgitation, it's travelling in the opposite direction to that which we'd be looking at for aortic stenosis, hence we're listening to the opposite part of the chest. Now, there's another special test that we need to do for aortic stenosis. So again, taking the pulse, if you could turn your head that way for me, and we're going to place, place the um, stethoscope on the patient's throat lightly, get them to take a deep breath in, and hold it, and breathe normally for me. And we're listening for a couple of beats, because here we're seeing if the aortic uh, stenosis brewery is travelling up the neck. So again, keeping in mind that bruises are to do with the flow of blood and the sound transmission, so we'll move in different directions. Having not had any abnormalities to uh, the chest, we then need to look at some of the other large vessels. So for that, we need to again lie the patient flat. With the patient lying flat, we then need to confirm again, do you have any pain or uh, discomfort in your stomach? So we're going to check for uh, uh, any evidence of uh, a triple A, so an aortic abdominal aneurysm, and then we're going to listen to see if we can find evidence of renal bruise. So we're just going to press down over the stomach, either side of the umbilicus, and I'm pressing quite hard because the um, aorta is a retroperitoneal organ, and I can feel the pulse coming through my hands, but it's not an expansile pulse, it's not pushing my hands away. We're then going to take the stethoscope, again with the diaphragm, uh, we're going to listen just uh, over the um, umbilicus. Okay, and I can't hear any evidence of bruise here. And then we're going to listen uh, laterally by about two, three centimeters and superior. Again, here we're trying to uh, find any evidence of bruise that might indicate uh, renal um, aneurysms, renal artery aneurysms. And again, on the opposite side. So there's no problems at that point. So we, we also need to check for radial femoral delay. So if you can just pull the top of your trousers down for me. Okay. And we're going to hold on to the radial pulse and we're going to feel over the femoral pulse at the top of the leg. And again, I can feel that the pulse is coming through at my fingers and on the uh, femoral pulse at the same time. We're going to do the same to the opposite side. And again, I've confirmed that we've got an intact uh, pulse there, so we've got no areas to, of concern there. So if you pull your trousers up for me. Moving down the bed, we want to have a look at uh, the legs, so we're seeing if there's any evidence of uh, peripheral edema. So we're going to press with three fingers for 10 seconds, and then we're going to have a look, and I can't see any imprints at all, suggesting there's no peripheral edema. And again, there's none here. We can also assess uh, the feet for the same features that we'd look for um, in uh, the hands, given that it's the same tissue, so we're likely to get a duplication of anything there. As well as having looked visually over the feet, we need to check for the peripheral vasculature. So we're going to press in to uh, the medial malleoli, and we're trying to find the posterior tibial pulse. The easiest way to find that is starting off over the medial malleoli and just dropping back into the dip behind it. And then we're going to bring our uh, hands round and we're going to check for uh, the dorsalis pedis. And we're going to press just uh, lateral to uh, the extensor tendon on the second toe. And we should be able to feel uh, the um, dorsalis pedis pulse coming through nice and strongly there. And we can go one step further just to confirm our capillary refill, which is under two seconds on both feet. To complete our examination, if I could just get you to sit up, please. And we're going to have a quick listen to the patient's chest. So if you cross your arms over your chest, please. And if you take a deep breath in for me. And out. In. And out. 
Deep breath in and out. Deep breath in and out. Deep breath in and out. And in and out. And in and out. And out. So we're listening all the way down to the lung basis to hear if we can see any evidence of pulmonary edema which might associate with heart failure. Similarly, in the same way that we've looked at the feet, we're going to press to the base of the back to see if there's any evidence of sacral edema, pressing with the three fingers with 10 millimetres of mercury, which we can determine because the fingertips will have gone white with pressure, and again, there's no indent here. So we uh, thank the patient, provide them with their shirt back, and do you have any questions for myself at this moment? No. Super. So thank you. So that completes our cardiovascular examination. Um, we've gone through all the steps uh, that um, are required for a standard medical school OSCE. There are additional information that you can find checking the video here on more um, detail for the cardiac murmurs if that's something that's of interest to you. Um, if you could like the video, it certainly tells YouTube that we're here and subscribing to the channel will let you interact with us more and help us guide where we're going to do future videos. With that, thank you for watching. Take care. And we'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.